This is the Constitutional Era Objective 2 about how the U.S. Constitution was created out of the existing Articles of Confederation. Now, you have to remember in the last objective, the upper class was getting worried because mobocracy was starting to rule the country. And the upper class, to protect their interests, wanted a stronger central government. The common man did not. The common man had just fought a war to get away from oppressive government. They liked the idea that the states had most of the power. They liked the idea that they weren't being ruled by an oppressive government in any way. But there were some obvious problems. Uh, states, uh, we mentioned them before, but states uh, often wouldn't recognize a marriage license from one state to another. If you move to another state, you'd have to get remarried according to that state's marriage laws. But some of the biggest differences or biggest problems were economic. Uh, states like Pennsylvania was instituting a high tariff on goods coming from New York. And the place they wanted to start in revising the articles was not to... Um, change everything about it, but to look at the economic and commerce aspects. Remember, the economy and protecting their interests was what the upper class was uh, concerned about the most. So in 1786, they decided to have a convention in Annapolis, Maryland, the Annapolis Convention, to deal with commerce aspects. Called for by the state of Virginia, nine states appointed delegates to the convention, but only five states even bothered to have anybody show up. So it was a huge disappointment. And Alexander Hamilton decided, well, we're going to organize another convention uh, for Philadelphia in 1787. That convention was called the Constitutional Convention of 1787, and it wasn't just to deal with the economic aspects. This was to revise the Articles of Confederation to make it uh, a little more stronger in the national level aspect, to have a, a federal level of government that was stronger than what they had. Remember, there had been no president, there had been no Supreme Court, and the Congress that they had, the U.S. Congress, had to ask for things from the states. They couldn't really command them to do anything. Now, at the Constitutional Convention, every state Congress, except Rhode Island, no particular reason, they just said, we don't want to be a part of it, sends delegates to discuss the ideas for a new governing document, in this case a constitution. There were 55 delegates in all that showed up. Now, the uh, convention itself starts on May 25th, 1787, in Philadelphia's Independence Hall. Now, the reason, here's a picture of Independence Hall today, and the reason it's called Independence Hall is because this is where the Declaration of Independence had been debated and signed in 1776. So they felt in an appropriate place if they were going to revolutionize the blueprint for American government and the structure of American government, they figured this would be a really good place to have it. Now, we'll get into that a little bit more and what was going on, but be aware of this as well. The Constitutional Convention, and here's a picture of inside Independence Hall, uh, the Constitu Constitutional Convention took place over the summer of 1787. Uh, it ended eventually on September 17, 1787, but by then only 42 delegates remained. Thirteen had just decided they didn't want any more part of this, and they left. Now, the main reason that people got tired of this process is it's in the summer. They're all wearing heavy wool. The windows are shut. The doors are shut. There's really no ventilation because they wanted to do everything in secret. Um, and, you know, the bottom line here is that nobody really totally got exactly what they wanted. The Constitution is, and this is important for you to note, the Constitution has often been described as a bundle of compromises. And, frankly, that's true. Uh, nobody was totally dissatisfied with the document, but nobody was totally satisfied with it either. And 13 people just said, you know, this isn't going anywhere how I want it to go. I don't really want any part of this. But more on that a little bit later. The biggest thing was that, and this is extremely important for you to remember, the delegates were told to revise the articles. They were supposed to take the Articles of Confederation and revise them. Instead, they totally scrapped it. They took the entire document and threw it out and came up with an entirely new document that would give the national level of government more power. That's why the sessions were held in secret, with guards at the doors and, of course, chaperones who followed this guy, Benjamin Franklin, uh, when uh, they went home for the evening. 
Franklin was 81 and pretty talkative at that point. He tended to ramble on quite a bit, as elderly people are prone to do. And uh, once he would go out in public after sessions to the local tavern or whatever, uh, chaperones accompanied him to make sure he wouldn't blurt out things that were going on in the Constitutional Convention itself. Now, who were these delegates? Well, most of the delegates were lawyers, merchants, and bankers, basically society's upper class. Notably, Thomas Jefferson did not attend, and often mockingly referred to them in public as demigods. Uh, you know, these were people, Jefferson wanted absolutely no part of this. He liked the idea of states having more power. He liked the idea of a weaker central government. And the people that were at this thing wanted a stronger central government. Now, 19 of the 55 delegates owned slaves, and that was going to become a, a particular sticky issue later on. George Washington was elected, uh, and you can see uh, old George right here, George Washington was elected chairman uh, of the Constitutional Convention for various reasons. He'd led the Revolutionary Army. Uh, he was honest and respected, so they decided that they wanted him to run the meeting. Um, also, James Madison, who's this guy right here, James Madison once again, later dubbed the father of the Constitution was one of the delegates. Madison played a vital role in drawing up the document itself and eventually was the author of the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments to the Constitution that would follow. And this guy, Alexander Hamilton, who had been Washington's uh, personal assistant in uh, the Revolutionary War. Hamilton was uh, a fairly brilliant uh, economic strategist, and he was also present at this meeting as well. But not everybody that was a patriot, not everybody that declared independence against Great Britain was for this idea, and there were some notable absences. Like we mentioned before, Jefferson was not there. John Adams, uh, who was a big part of the American Revolution, uh, was not there either. Samuel Adams, uh, who in fact was a brewer, uh, as you know from the beer, uh, but uh, Sam Adams was also a, a fairly significant leader of the American Revolution. He did not like the idea of redrawing the government that they had set up, so he wasn't there either. And John Hancock, who had written uh, the, the biggest signature on the Declaration of Independence, these were all people that had signed on to break away from Great Britain, but people who did not want any part of this constitutional convention. And the main reason why is because they were afraid of the changes. They liked the Articles of Confederation and wanted them left alone. Which brings us back to the actual changes that took place at the constitutional convention to the Articles of Confederation. Now, this was again supposed to be a series of revisions to the Articles of Confederation, uh, and it eventually became a total scrapping of them. But the one area that they did somewhat actually revise rather than totally get rid of was with the U.S. Congress as it existed. Now, again, during the Articles of Confederation, there was a U.S. Congress with no power. Uh, they didn't like the structure of it, and they adopted some plans to change it. Now, varying states had varying interests in what should happen. Bigger states wanted a certain thing, and smaller states wanted something else. What the bigger states did was uh, come up with a proposal called the Virginia Plan, right here. Now, I know it's hard to think of Virginia as a bigger state, but remember, we didn't have Texas or California or Alaska yet, so Virginia and New York and Pennsylvania were actually pretty big states. Now, the Virginia plan to uh, reform the structure of Congress called for a bicameral uh, or two-house Congress based on population. Now, when you hear bicameral, I want you to think of bicycle. Uh, um, you know, when you think of it that way, two wheels. Uh, bi means more than one, or in this case, bi means two, I should say. So they wanted a two-house Congress based on population. Now, of course, uh, larger states loved this idea because they had more population. Therefore, if they had more people, then they could get more representatives in the lower house of this Congress that they were proposing. States were represented in proportion to their population. The more people you have, the more representatives you get. And those representatives would elect people to the state legislatures from those states in the upper house of Congress. So, you know, bigger states could have a lot of power that way. 
Now, as far as smaller states were concerned, this was a power play by the bigger states. And so they came up with their own plan from William Patterson in New Jersey, and this was called the New Jersey Plan. Now, the New Jersey Plan was completely different in the sense that it was a unicameral house proposal. In other words, a one-house Congress. Think of unicycle uh, with one wheel. Think of unibrow. We don't even want to get into that. And think of uh, unicorn, meaning one corn, I guess. But you get the idea is that it's a, a one-house Congress. Now, this again is favored by smaller states like New Jersey, who were suspicious of the bigger states, and it basically said that everybody would still get an equal vote in Congress like they had during the Articles of Confederation. The Articles had given each state one vote. Well, the New Jersey plan called to keep that. Well, there was constant fighting between these two sides, and they eventually had to come up with the first of many compromises in this bundle of compromises that came to be known as the U.S. Constitution, and that was the Great Compromise, also known as the Connecticut Compromise. Now, you have to remember that the summer conditions of this thing are in a sealed building, uh, no ventilation, heavy clothing, led to days of angry debate. I mean, when you're going to be in those conditions, you're, you're going to get impatient. And it led to days of angry debate about the plans. The convention almost ended before anything got done. Uh, they almost, everybody almost walked out on this one first proposal. So they had to come up with a solution, and they did. The final result was a bicameral Congress. Now, this is the U.S. Congress as we know it today, with a House of Representatives, a lower house based on population, and a Senate, an upper house, uh, where each state gets two senators. This is the model that we still use today. For example, uh, I know for a fact that, uh, at least at the time that I made this film, uh, Wyoming only had one representative in the U.S. House of Reps. Uh, they had almost no power to determine things in the House of Representatives. California, on the other hand, was up in the 50s. The city of Los Angeles alone, at the time that I filmed this, had 24 representatives themselves just for the city of L.A. because the population was so huge there. But in the Senate, Wyoming got two senators and California got two senators. Didn't matter what size of the population was in each one of those states. In the Senate, Wyoming had just as much power as California did. Now, the Constitutional Convention also creates the office of president, but it makes it the most checked branch of the government. And they also collect the Electoral College to elect the president. So things seem to be going along swimmingly. And then there was a problem. The southern states started to celebrate because they thought they were going to dominate this new government. They figured, well, you know, we have so many slaves that once we get to count them as part of the population, we'll have an incredible number of representatives in Congress and the South will rule forever. Uh, slavery will stay in place, uh, the South will, will uh, uh, dominate everything. Well, the North basically said no. Uh, slaves were property, according to the southern states, and so the North said to the southern representatives, you might as well go ahead and count your horses and your cows and your furniture if you want to, because you consider them to be property too. Now, the South, of course, took offense to this and said, no, slaves are people and we're going to count them as a part of our population. And the North said, if you consider them people, then set them free and give them their rights. Well, obviously this created a big problem, so they decided to come up with a compromise. The compromise was simply this. Three of every five slaves would be counted as part of the population. It's one of the most racist laws we've ever come up with. It's called the three-fifths compromise, because if you do the math a little bit differently, you're basically saying that every slave is three-fifths of a person. Uh, unfortunately, the North said we have to do this, we'll deal with the slavery issue in future years, but this convention will end if we don't settle on this compromise. And so they did. That's it for now. Thanks for listening.